Climbing up Mount Kilimanjaro is an accomplishment not many people in the world will ever accomplish. Now imagine you climb up the 20,000 foot peak by bear crawling up the whole way. All Inclusive, a podcast on inclusion, innovation, and social justice with Jay Ruderman. Hi, I'm Jay Ruderman, and this is All Inclusive. My guest today is the first person to bear crawl up Mount Kilimanjaro and Mount Aconcagua, Kyle Maynard. Uh, Kyle, welcome, and I'm sure this is going to be a really interesting discussion. Uh, Maybe I can start out by just asking you a little bit about what it was like to grow up, you know, with your family and and your... um, your friends and and what was life like from you know the time you were a toddler to growing into you know an adult yeah i um to give your your audience a little bit more of a perspective um on my disability so it's congenital amputation and um my arms end at the elbow and my legs end at the the knee being born with it you know i've, I've never really known any other way so um, my family's attitude growing up was to try to make things as, as normal as possible and, um, you know, do everything they could to try to uh, just to help me adapt into a world that wasn't necessarily fit for, for me to be able to adapt in, as I'm sure many of your listeners can, can relate to, whether they had the disability all throughout their life or, or something that they, you know, had from an incident or injury or illness, um, You know, I think that it just taught me that mentality, though, that every single person on the planet has a disability. It's probably one of the one big things that that unites us and just to not be limited by it. So what that looked like growing up, you know, was just learning how to, you know, pick up a spoon and drop it a thousand times until I figured out how to go and and feed myself. You know, now hold it just between the ends of my arms and swing it around to go and and scoop up food um, to, you know, drive me in a fairly minimally adapted vehicle. living on my own in, uh, out in, you know, West coast for, for five years, you know, 3000 miles away from home and, um, you know, getting to, to wrestle, compete in jujitsu football and, um, climb some of the highest mountains in the world. So it, it, frankly, like none of those things I would have ever imagined would have been possible in the, you know, in the beginning. And, um, it's amazing. I think what can become possible once we stay focused on, on, um, on the possibilities. And your sisters, um, I guess you have three sisters who seem to have been really um, just accepting you as 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 their brother and and being really supportive of you growing up. I'm sure that was also, you know, that household that you grew up in was a very strong um, household to to have your childhood. Yeah, they um, to kind of illustrate like a ridiculousness of of the point of. Um, how, uh, you know, they, they didn't try to focus on the disability basically. So there was, um, at home, it just, you know, wasn't really something that we put a lot of attention or focus on, you know, we called it like the Jedi mind trick, right? Like they, they just tried to focus the attention towards something else. And it's almost like perception becomes reality in a certain way. Like perception is perception and reality is reality. But like what we perceive is a great deal of like what, you know, what a reality becomes. And so my sister, one day she was like at school and there was a, a new kid that came to class that was a amputee. And, um, and she was like, mom, mom, I'm this kid came to school. And he doesn't have it. He's missing an arm. I wonder how he does this. I wonder how he does that. And my mom told her, she's like, you do realize like your brother doesn't have arms or legs. And she was like, Whoa, I never even really thought about that. <laughs> you know? And so it's kind of, uh, something that, I learned that really changed my life when I learned it was the idea that the map is not the territory, you know, and what that means is like when we're navigating through a specific territory, then, you know, our, our ability to be able to navigate through that territory is only going to be as useful as the map that we actually have. And, you know, it's the map is never going to be the territory itself, right? That the territory is infinitely complex, but yet the closer we can get the map to the territory itself and the better we're able to go and navigate. So, you know, you are an athlete and and in many ways an extreme athlete and growing up you really you know focused on on sports in high school and and decided to to wrestle in fact you lost 
your first 36 matches in your senior year, but end up becoming 12th in the nation. Where did that drive come from? Was that, was that because of bullying or is that just something inside saying, I'm going to put my focus into being the best athlete I can? It was a lot of factors. I, I, can't, I can't think that it relates back to any one thing, but I think that, um, you know, bullying is an interesting thing too, right? Because I mean, it's, it's something that if I, I can't say that it didn't play a factor or a role, right? That like the idea of, you know, the, the sports that I specifically got into were very like, you know, sort of masculine, you know, or like the combat sports, right? Like, like, or like very challenging things like climbing mountains, things, things of that nature. So I think that idea of like trying to like express myself physically was for sure like a big, a big factor um, and not, you know, wanting to, to be bullied, you know, and I think the wrestling gave me that ability. When I first got into it though, I, I hated the sport because in wrestling, like you're out there all alone as you and your opponent on the mat. Right. And so it's very different than in football. Like if in, in a football game, if your teammate drops the ball and you know, you, you lose the winning touchdown, but like you, you played a good game yourself, then like you can walk away and be like, oh, okay, you know, I did my best and that, you know, was out of my control. Wrestling was very different in the sense that like, it was just me and my opponent out there and I was all alone. And so there was no ability to be able to go and blame it on anybody else other than myself as to whatever happened. And also, you know, it just, the, the losses like wore on me. Like I, I don't want to give anybody the impression that like, you know, that that was, you know, an easier time. Like I, I was like begging my mom and dad to let me quit and uh, hated the sport at the time. I did not, was not having a good time. And people at the time were basically saying that it was borderline child abuse that my mom and dad were making me do it. So, you know, that's, that's the crazy part. And then you fast forward to my senior year of high school, there was a different discussion. Um, and it, it they had a, a piece that was on um, HBO real sports. And um, part of the, part of the piece that centered on, on that was, you know, whether or not I had an unfair advantage over the, the athletes that's competing against. And so, you know, it's just quite a juxtaposition from where I started, where, you know, it was zero and 35 when I first started out and, and absolutely, you know, hating the sport. And then all of a sudden my senior year of high school, you know, winning the 36 varsity matches and, you know, getting to go and beat state champions and um, state placers and um, compete at a, at a high level. So let's talk about that. First of all, tell me about your coaches, because usually – um, coaches play a pivotal role in either encouraging athletes to move forward or uh, deterring them. So I, my guess is that you were blessed with with some really special coaches. For sure. I was very blessed with the, the coaches that uh, I've had in my life. Um, my football coach, because I, I started out football was the first organized team sport that I played. And there was even a, a bit more discussion as to whether or not I should be allowed to play in football. In fact, there was um, a seven member board and uh, that was deciding whether or not I was allowed to play. There was three votes for me, three votes against me. And my football coach, Tom Shy, had to go and lobby and fight for the seventh vote for me to be able to play. Had he not done that, then we wouldn't be having this conversation. And you know, the, the idea was that it was going to be too dangerous to be, you know, hurt and liabilities, all of those things. And, and I completely understand that, you know, literally like the, the way that I was, would tackle people was I would take my helmet and I would smash it into my opponent's shins as hard as I could. <laughs> so Sounds painful. yeah, it probably was more for them than for me, but, <laughs> you know, I think, you know, in the, in the world of like the, the head injury stuff that we have today in conversation, like, I don't think that I would be allowed to play, which then begs the question of like, is that the right thing for, for us, for the world, for society? Like, you know, um, because if I hadn't been allowed to play and hadn't been allowed to do that, then it would have turned out it's a very different path. And my, my wrestling coach, he would get down, um, with my dad in the first early goings, he would stay after practices and like he was the head high school varsity coach and would stay after in the youth program and spend a significant amount of time working with me where he would tuck his arms into his sleeves and try to roll wrestle from my perspective to go and give me an idea of, you know, how to, how to move. And, um, 
you know, try to come up with moves from my perspective. Well, I, I recently um, watched a talk by uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger who said that um, those people who are successful in life have a goal and that goal drives them. So you obviously had a goal and that goal, you know, despite all the losses to start off with, that goal pushed you to stay with the sport and not to leave. Mm. But let's talk about all the, like, I mean, did you have opponents who said, listen, I, I'm not, I don't want to fight him. Or um, did you have people in the crowds who were just, you know, heaping abuse on you? And, and, and how'd you deal with that? Not so much in wrestling. Um, in wrestling, it, it didn't seem to be that, that much of an issue. There, there was some debate, you know, I think mostly among the parents of the kids that I'd beat that they were trying to come up with things where they're like r- absurd, ridiculous things where they're like, Kyle can't put his hands above the starting line, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, and like a very like legalistic interpretation of the rules to try to like deter me from actually doing it. And so I think my coach went to a rules meeting, had conversations with the referees and they were able to, to move past that. Um, in MMA, it's a bit of a different scenario. Um, I did have a number of opponents who backed out until I actually got uh, my opponent that I fought Brian Fry in, in the fight. And I give him a tremendous amount of credit for, for taking that fight because it was just, I think, you know, at the time I had been on Oprah and Larry King and had received a lot of this, you know, bigger media attention. And um, when we did that fight, I think like six times more people had Googled my name than even when I was on Oprah. So there was a lot of attention on it. We had, you know, camera crews and um, from ESPN, all the major like, you know, MMA networks and all that stuff were covering it. Um, and so it was, it was just like a very big spectacle. And then frankly, he, he was an amateur fighter as well. Right. I think he'd had like four or five amateur fights at that point, you know, this all of a sudden turned into like a, you know, not quite the level of like a Conor McGregor title fight, but approaching that as far as the amateur scale goes. And, um, but he did it anyway and stepped in and, and fought, and, you know, without him, you know, I wouldn't have had that chance to be able to do it. So what, I mean, it sounds a little crazy, like, like what, what possessed you to want to do to enter an MMA match? I mean, MMA, I'm not, I'm not an aficionado, but I understand that it's a caged match and um, there's a lot more that goes into it than a regular wrestling match. So what, why does Kyle decide, you know, I, I want to try to be an MMA fighter? Good question. <laughs> I think um, I think I've I've always loved like the the tests and the challenges for sure. And and there there is a purity is inside of um, especially in martial arts, right? That in artistry that exists that is you know hard to experience out, outside of it. Um, Andrew and I were talking about this yesterday, you know, it's, it's when you hold someone down or someone's holding you down or, you know, it, it, like there's a different level of fight that comes out of you that like you can't experience otherwise, you know, it's like, I've, I've, I've pushed myself really, really hard in CrossFit workouts and mountain climbing and all that kind of stuff. And it's not the same thing as when you, like, you're in there. And so, if, you know, if you're locked in a cage with somebody else, it does sound like a crazy thing. And I think to 99.9% of people that that might be the case, but you know, for me, it's something I've, I've, I was a huge fan of the sport and getting to, to be in there and to experience it, it was it was absolutely wild. You know, I mean, he had wrestling matches too, or, or like really, you know, in jujitsu they're, they're like your adrenaline is going, you know, it's a really heightened experience, but at the same time, it's, um, it's different. When I remember when I was, when I was hit for the first time, I thought, Whoa, I'm not in a wrestling match anymore. You know, I don't know. It was, it was a, a, a different kind of feeling came out. I still was not able to execute my game plan Mike Tyson says, he's like, everybody's got a plan until you get punched in the face. Right. That was the truth. <laughs> and I was like, wow, you know, I felt that. And all of the the fight, too, to go into to get to that point as well. There was a tremendous fight with the Athletic Commission in Georgia. And, 
you know, the, the head commissioner himself is, is in a wheelchair. He was an off-duty police officer that was shot in the spine. So, he, you know, he told me face-to-face, you know, looked me in the eye and said, like, I'll be there cage side when you do this. I think it's a really inspiring thing that you're helping people with disabilities, you know, and changing the perception. And then all of a sudden, like, due to the public pressure and the sort of outcry that it was ridiculous that I was doing it, then his attitude changed completely. And it was a unanimous decision to, to deny me. So that's why I ended up going to Alabama to do, to do the fight there because there was significantly less government regulation. And I have joked, you know, half jokingly, half serious that if I wanted to fight like a pack of hyenas in, in Alabama, they probably would have let me. And, you know, but that it, in, in truth though, it like allowed me to have that opportunity to, to, to do it. And, um, you know, again, I don't know if, if that's something that would even be possible today. So Kyle, you do a tremendous amount of public speaking and on, on the story on ESPN, you said that you were happy for the 45 minutes while you were doing the public speaking, but then for the 23 hours and 15 minutes afterwards, you were depressed. Can you talk a little bit about mental health and how that's impacted you? I mean, we're going through a time now when there's a tremendous amount of people dealing with mental health on all different levels, but maybe you can, if you share about your own mental health and how you've, you've dealt with it. Yeah. Um, I've always said, you know, some of the most challenging disabilities are, are ones that you, you can't necessarily see on the outside. I think we can be close to people that we're around, but we can never really truly know what somebody else is, is enduring and going through. And for me, um, especially in that period, it was, you know, I, I went from being a full-time high school student, uh, freshman in college at UGA when I got to go and release my book. And so I went from, you know, literally just high school wrestler, early college wrestler, athlete, hanging out with friends, you know, to now all of a sudden like New York Times bestselling book, traveling the world, all of this, you know, crazy stuff. Um, just a whirlwind transition. And, um, and that was, was really challenging. I, I was alone for a significant amount of it. And my friends were back at home, you know, having fun, continuing to go to school. And I was, was off traveling. I was speaking for, you know, different groups. And um, I wasn't eating my own dog food. I was, was not practicing the message that I was talking to other people about of that, like no excuses message. Right. And I got very discouraged and um, was was ready to quit and um, had a chance meeting with a couple of service members, um, armed service members who had been through some really, really hard times and injuries themselves who told me that my story had helped them like get back on their feet. And that made a, it just an enormous difference to me and made me realize that like the, the you know, the work that I was doing was, was important. And I remember I, after that happened, I came home and I, I went to my hotel room and I just cried. You know, I had a dream to want to be in the military growing up. And uh, my dad was in the army and, you know, it, it tried, you know, would have done anything. They told me it could be a chaplain. I was like, oh, that's cool. Does he get a gun? <laughs> you know, and wanted to be out there on the front lines. And, um, you know, there was a different plan in place, but, at the same time, I, I don't know, I, it just woke me up to realize that like, okay, this, you know, this is what matters and, you know, like, um, being able to like make a difference in the lives of other people instead of just, you know, going out there and like collecting a check from the speaking engagements that I was doing. And, uh, that was a, a tough period. And, and not just that, you know, maybe that that's one point in time, you know, at a younger age, I was at a point in time with my life and disability where I was, you know, ready to give up on my life. Like it was just like too much at, at 10 years old. I tried to end my life. Um, you know, there was a lot of, a uh, lot of pain in, in different points in time throughout. And even more recently um, in, in the past, like six to eight months, you know, it's been a time to kind of like really like stop and reflect and, and to stop and to slow down and just to, to, just be grateful for the little things and, you know, for family, for, um, you know, just waking up another day. Well, I think that, you know, none of us know who we're touching 
and sometimes it can be a small act or a small interaction and you can have a huge in impact on someone's life. Um, but I think also, I mean, talking about like the small steps and you know, now having an appreciation for taking the time and looking at the small steps. I mean, you, you've done some really challenging things. I mean, you, you climbed Mount Kilimanjaro in Africa and uh, yeah. a Concagua in Argentina. And I mean, I remember watching the video of you saying, listen, at, at some point, I'm just looking three feet ahead and that's yeah. my goal. You know, I just yeah. want to get, I just want to get three feet ahead and that's what's motivating me. First of all, what led you? And and I saw I saw that you know in the videos. I mean, you had to have special fittings on on your limbs right. uh, in order to walk over you know rocks and dirt and snow and ice. Um, and you're doing a bear crawl, which you know, for those of us that work out, a bear crawl across a room is 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 excruciating. Uh, but to to do it, you know, for miles up up a mountain, why did you do it? What 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 possessed you to do to do those climbs? I'd say the initial possession occurred because I wanted to go places that my wheelchair couldn't take me. You know, there there are no handicap ramps on Kilimanjaro. You know, there's not there's not going to be a um, you know a tram line that gets you to the top. And frankly, even if there was, it's a very different experience. Like there's a there's a, a mountain in, in in Atlanta called Stone Mountain that um, you know it's I think it's it's the technically the the largest continuous hunk of granite in in the world. Right, and, um, I know it well. Mountain. Very very controversial in 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 today's day. Yeah, it is. And it, um, it's also, you know, been a really special place for me to where I started my climbing. Um, I literally, when I started climbing, had bath towels wrapped around my arms and my feet um, that my friends had helped duct tape on to, um, to, to hike it. So it's about 900 feet above, you know, above ground. And uh, I had been to Stone Mountain with my family a bunch of times growing up whenever somebody would come into town and we'd go and we'd take pictures and, you know, it's a cool experience when I hiked it for the first time. I literally like tore all the skin off my arms. I was brutalized from the experience. It was a CrossFit competition. The first workout was a thousand meter row and then a sprint up Stone Mountain. I did it in leather welding sleeves. And um, it was just, you know, a really painful thing. I literally, I took an hour and 40 something minutes, I think an hour and 46 minutes maybe. Uh, most people finish that workout in 25 minutes and I got to the top and was like, wow, this is like, like totally different. Like it's actually like really beautiful. And so I'd been to the top before and then all of a sudden when I got to the top, you know, after climbing it in my own, um, steam, then it was just a totally different experience. So you're climbing Kilimanjaro and um, you reach a point, I don't know how far up, but, but miles up and it's just excruciating. And, and you're, you're telling yourself and, you're, and, and your fellow climbers, I, I just don't know if I can do this. And, and a decision is made to climb a much more difficult route uh, called the Western Breach, which is very rocky. And, you know, in the video, you're like, let's do it. I'm going to do it. Can you, can you talk about that decision? Like what, you know, put your, you're all the way up there and, and you put yourself in, in an even more dangerous situation. Yeah. Um, I knew that going the Western breach route would shave off five days of the total trip time. And so I was looking at like a longer, slow death. Basically, like I had like a pebble inside of, it wasn't like a pebble. It was sort of like a, there was a part of my right arm socket that was like a princess in the B kind of like thing that was just grinding into my arm. It was creating some of the most intense pain I've ever felt. And I, I was at like a, a breaking point and knew that like five more days of that was just not going to work. But I knew that, I could get through one day of, of anything. I was like, you know, one day can get through anything. And I knew as long as my guide, 
you know, determined that it was safe, you know, and, and that we could go, we, we ultimately had a team meeting and, and presented the option to everybody and said, you know, that we can split into two groups. One group can continue to go on the original path, you know, if people choose to do that and the other group can, can go up and everybody decided to to stay, which, you know, I'm almost going to get like emotional thinking about it. Um, cause we ended up, you know, relying on each other a lot there, um, to do it. And, and really that one day was a brutal day. And there was, you know, it was a steeper path, rock fall. Um, and it was, you know, that was a, it was a really just special day. Cause that was the first day that I, recall touching ice and once we were in like hit the ice and we're sitting in the tundra and it could look back and I could see the rainforest that we had started out in it was just one of the you know that night was probably we slept inside of the crater rim in the tundra you know and it was one of the coldest you know one of the coldest nights of, of my life my guide who's who's been on the top of you know, most major mountains around the world, you know, he, he echoed the same thing too. And said it was one of the coldest nights of his life. And, um, it was just another, with that next morning we got up and, um, had another 900 feet to go to hit the summit and after the Western breach. And, um, I thought that was kind of symbolic because I mean, it's almost the exact distance of, of a single stone mountain. You're listening to all inclusive with Jay Ruderman. You can learn more. View the show notes and transcripts at rudermanfoundation.org slash all-inclusive. Please remember to subscribe, rate, and review us wherever you are listening. And and you were carrying the remains of a fallen service member. And and is it someone that you knew or, you know, because it seemed to be a very symbolic you know, to get to the top, to be able to disperse the ashes on the top uh, was something very important to you. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. um, I met Corey's mom. Corey Johnson was the name of the the soldier. And I met his mom in a gym in Arizona before, before we left. And, um, and she had lost him, I think five months prior and um, he had a wife, had uh, two little girls. I believe his wife was pregnant with their third daughter when he left on his final deployment. And um, on the fourth night of the, the climb, um, when I was ready to quit, the thought that ran through my head that um, was almost like, um, I don't know even know how to describe it. Like the word is almost like indignation. You know, it was like the, the fact that like I knew that you know, he wouldn't have that opportunity to go and, and be on that climb with his girls. And that I was there and that I, I was choosing to, to, to be there and to, you know, like I still had that like choice to be alive and continue to push to the top. And I felt like a presence there with me. I felt, you know, I felt like I, I had him as like our, our 10th, you know, teammate. In addition to all of the, the we had nine Americans on the team. Um, you know, Corey is sort of our honorary 10th teammate. And um, that moment of getting to leave Corey's ashes there on the summit on Kilimanjaro was, you know, was, was absolutely, you know, I've described it as the, the biggest honor of my life. And I believe that to be the case. It's extremely emotional. Um, and I would urge anyone to, to, to watch a clip of, of your final ascent to the summit. Um, when you summited Mount, um, Aconcagua um, in Argentina in some ways I think you said that was even more difficult because of the conditions the conditions, the altitude so it, the difference between Kilimanjaro is 19,341 feet Aconcagua is 22,800 and I think 809 something like that so the difference between 19,000 feet and almost 23,000 feet you know it, that that doesn't seem like a ton, but it, it's not a linear increase. It becomes like a, a almost not quite exponential difference, but it, it becomes like a significant, like a you know geometric kind of curve, parabolic. Like once you, you're going up that high, like we spent 
maybe four or five nights above the altitude of the summit on Kilimanjaro. So your body is just in the state of, of decay and, you know, really like pushed to the, to the limit there. And, um, it, I think was just, you know, there was also too a bit of like what I believe to be like divine intervention and like celestial alignment, <laughs> like literally like the, the, the heavens opened. It was the most perfect summit day, every single, and we were still like, I hit the summit at 4 15 PM, um, which was 15 minutes past our turnaround time, which are, my guide gave me as a grace period. And thankfully, you know, we had some, some issues, you know, and, and, but it was just, it was a really, really intense day. There was, um, you know, and psychologically too, it was, was, was really, was, was difficult as well. There was, um, an American climber that we knew that was 24 hours ahead of us that, um, had fallen, like fallen down from a stroke and hit his head and had died and had just brought his body down, like, like right as we had, uh, had gotten there. And, you know, I was thinking to myself, like the same thing, like, you know, my body was in full shutdown mode. Like, do I continue to go and push forward for the summit or like, is that going to go and cost me my life? Yeah, and, uh, certainly um, not for everyone. And, 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 you know, I got to give you a lot of credit that, you know, you pushed yourself to your limits. Why don't we talk a little bit about hidden disabilities? You mentioned, uh, to me in the past that you, that you have ADHD and um, maybe you can talk about that and what impact it's had on, on your life and, and sure. how it shaped your life. Yeah. Um, I mean, so for starters, it's not really something that I've talked about a ton, you know, so um, it was kind of new to me, but I know it's something that like it would, would probably have been more beneficial to like to bring up earlier. I know a ton of people, you know, battle the same, you know, or similar challenges. Um, I think that like, it, you know, for, for starters, one of the things that comes to mind was, you know, assigning books for, for kids where the, you know, I would be writing an inscription and that the parent would go and tell me like, Oh, my child has, you know, ADD or ADHD. And then I would have like a, a conversation and dialogue with them and go and tell them like, you know, basically like, Hey, like I, I, I got the same thing too. You know, it's like, maybe, maybe I didn't say that in the speech, but like, it's, it's definitely, you know, been you know a challenge in my life, but I've always called it like my secret superpower too, because I think that like, you know, like we've talked about before with disabilities, it's kind of like both sides of the coin, right? There's the adversity that we go and face from it, but it also shapes us and molds us and helps build us into to who we are. And, and also, you know, just statistically empirically, I know, you know, tons of people with ADHD, you know, do pretty, you know, incredible things with their life, whether it's like, you know, becoming first responders or special operations of the military, you know, entrepreneurs. I think that people are like 300% more likely to be an entrepreneur with AD, ADD or ADHD than without. So, you know, sometimes like we get caught in like, I think that like diagnosing something as you know, like, and we can like put like that box and that characteristic around it and create the limitations around what something could be as opposed to like seeing it for the beauty that it can go and be. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't have enormous, you know, challenges and, and consequences too, right? Like, I think the internal aspect of the disability that I've faced, the one that you can't see on the outside is probably as hard or harder than, than the physical nature of the disability too, right? So like people can go and see, you know, if, if your listeners recall from like, you know, I was talking before, like basically I'm born a congenital amputee. So my arms end at the elbows and legs end at the knees. And, um, that's, you know, obviously presented, you know, other, other challenges, other opportunities too, but you know, the hidden things, the unseen disabilities, like, you know, like that, that, that I face there, like it, it's, it's, it's a totally different, totally different world, totally different, um, set of challenges. And, you know, I, I went and resorted to try to like medicate for a long time, you know, especially like with, um, you know, caffeine, you know, into like prescription medication and Ritalin and Adderall, um, you know, and other, you know, types of, uh, stimulants and, um, sought kind of anything that I could to try to like help, you know, make it better. Um, you know, I know even, 
recreational drug use at points for escapism. You know, I, I would never would have like, wouldn't have considered it like, you know, full blown addiction to things other than like stimulants and caffeine in particular. But like, I know it could become a big issue, right? Like if we, you know, rely upon on something that, you know, in order to go and compensate and overcome. I mean, every single person on the planet has like those, those hidden disabilities too, right? Like I can't necessarily right. look at you and know what yours are. And that's the crazy part about it too. So it's like, what do we do with that? Like, I, I figured, you know, that would just, it would be interesting to have this conversation with you and, and open up and like, and share about something I never really shared about before. Right. Yeah. I, I have a son with ADHD who, um, you know, I, I can just tell he's going to be a great entrepreneur and it's part of who he is. And, uh, you know, I think with, uh, especially with, uh, mental health issues, a lot of us don't want to talk about it. And there's, there's a tremendous amount of stigma around it, but, um, you're a very visible person and, and you've been, you know, um, very outspoken about, you know, what you can do and what you've been, what you've accomplished, um, as a person with a disability. There's so many different people who are great athletes are speaking out. I think it's going to do um, wonders for our kids. Yeah, I'm, I'm hopeful for that too. I mean, I think that like, if, if I put myself in like, you know, in your, in your son's shoes, for instance, right? Like if I got diagnosed with something that, you know, most people would go and look at and, you know, and, and think of it as, as this like really negative thing. But then I go and see other people that have done successful, you know, like lived a great life and, you know, achieved great things that had the same thing. It completely kind of like reframes and shifts the, the disability, you know, it would make me more, more proud of it in that way. Right. Like I would want to embrace it and I don't want to downplay or diminish like the, the difficulty that something is, especially with ADD, right? Like it's, you know, but then at the same time, it's like, like the positive side of that too, though. Like I realized that like, wow, like that's actually like a huge gift and a superpower to be able to go and see, you know, different threats or things like that, or, you know, other things that other people wouldn't necessarily realize respond to ADD people too respond to fear in a, in a different way. That's why like most people, so like, you know, like first responders and uh, oftentimes, you know, military um, and, you know, like I'm sure maybe frontline workers on, on any level right now that like, you know, like have to deal with like that response to fear, you know, and, and going into scary situations, you know, entrepreneurship in and of itself is like a scary thing, right? You're, you're taking like an unproven concept and you're, you know, you're trying to go and make something work with it and trying to like adapt it. And, you know, you don't necessarily know if it's going to work. Right. But then at the same time, like, if you never know, you never, you, you don't, you know, if you don't try, you never know, you know, you don't get to have like, you know, like a company, like a Uber, you know, appear overnight and, and completely like change the, the entire like world. Right. Like if without somebody that has like that kind of thinking of like, just, you know, thinking in a, in a totally different way. So yeah. I think that that's, I mean, not- I, I- I think there's so many people in history that have probably had um, mental health issues that we just don't know about, but it was part of who they were and, or who they are. And it made them great entrepreneurs, great artists, um, great athletes. And it's something that, you know, I, I, I totally get you. I mean, the, the, the traditional classroom for someone who has ADHD or ADD is not, the, the 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 best environment but you know um it doesn't have anything to do with intelligence doesn't have anything to do with the you know your abilities to succeed and i think you know we have to blow those stigmas away in order to uh, allow people to feel good about you know who they are and and, and what they can do in our world yeah you know, not only is it like is, is the traditional classroom not set up for people in, in that it's it's almost like the exact opposite, right? Like it's, there's that latent aspect of our, of our DNA and our, our like, you know, our, our, our biology that we're suppressing, especially among like this specific group of people who are potentially some of the most important people in our society, in our culture that, you know, are, like are, are, you know, effectively at times just being punished because, you know, you can't sit still and, you know, listen to a lecture or, or, or whatever, like, you know, right. but then at the same time they can go out and solve, you know, enormous problems and, you know, and, and be great leaders in so many other ways and so many other industries. Right. So I'll tell you something about my son, you know, he's been, um, 
diagnosed and, and, and doctors have said, listen, if you are going to succeed in a classroom environment, you have to take some medication to handle your um, executive functioning and be able to sit in the classroom and, and, and keep up with the work. And he's like, I'm not doing it. I'm not taking medication. You know, I will not do that. And um, we're like, all right, you know, that's your choice, but this may be difficult. He's like, no, nope, you know, it doesn't, I don't feel myself. And he's like, there are, I have friends who do take it. And I have friends that don't take it and I don't want to take it. I want to feel myself and, and I'm, I'm going to do fine in school. So, you know, there's no one uh, formula. Um, I know people feel strongly on, 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 you know, different ends of the spectrum about, you know, medication or, or, or no medication, but, you know, I don't think that, you know, whether he is successful in a, in a traditional environment or whether he's not successful is going to reflect on, on his ultimate success in life. I mean, I, I can just tell from his personality that, that, you know, he will be a successful person. So, um, you know, I, I totally get it. I, I really appreciate you, you know, speaking out and you talking about this, you know, aspect of yourself because, um, it's in us all, you know, there's no one who is completely um, perfect. I don't think perfect uh, is meant to exist or, or what perfect actually is. Um, but we're all, um, we all have a role. And I think that we sure. should be proud of ourselves and love ourselves. Let, let me just ask you, um, what's the future hold for you? I mean, you, you're an athlete, you know, where, where does your athletics take you? Um, what's the next challenge for you? And I'd also ask you to give, you know, for all of, you know, those listeners, especially younger listeners, what piece of advice would you like to depart to them? I think, um, you know, right now I'm kind of in that, um, process of, uh, of recreating and, and redreaming, like, you know, who, who I am and, and what I want to go and take on and do next. And there's a, a million different things and directions. It's almost, um, you know, narrowing it down is the, the difficulty. Um, Cause you know, all, all of us have 24 hours in a day and there's only so many different things that we can go and do and, and take on. And um, yet at the same time, like I said, you know, really like the, and I don't say this to, you know, to be com- completely, absurd cliche, but like, like the, the biggest lesson that I'm learning right now. And I think that the lesson that I've been part to others is like, you know, really to, to stop and smell the roses and, you know, it, it, in, in the world right now, like it's, it's just, it's crazy. What's, what's, you know, the, the, I think a lot of it is the, you know, the, the 24 hour news cycle, you know, focuses so much on, on the negative side of things. Right. And especially when we're inside and, you know, connected to our devices and that we're, we're having more of like a, you know, digital communication and interactions with, with each other, then it's, um, you know, it's easy to lose sight of the fact that there's still so much good in the world. And that like, as, uh, as a species, as a, you know, just global community, we've come a long way and there's still a long way to go. But at the same time, I think if there's, there's one unifying thing that would, would matter to me in terms of leadership and my contribution. And I, I think that you're right. I think you, you made an interesting point there and I will retract what I said of like not seeing myself as, as, as a leader inside of the community, because what I do in terms of, of you know, my own path and leadership is, is my own path and leadership, but what you do inside of yours is yours and that they're both critical, that they're both important. But I think in terms of going forward, you know, I learned recently that the, the word prosperity, it actually means towards hope. And I think that that's the, the direction that I feel, you know, aligned with most is, is continue to go in and, and help drive myself, you know, and, and hopefully those uh, around me and that those I interact with, you know, towards hope that the future can be better than it is today. Well, Kyle, I, w- I really want to thank you. This has been an interesting conversation. I've learned so much from you, um, not only from our discussion, but from seeing you in action on film, um, which I would urge people to, to, to Google you and to, and, and, and to see, you know, what you've done and also to, to read your book, no excuses. Um, you know, I want to wish you the best of luck. I know, you know, these are trying times, but things are going to get better. And you have so much energy to depart to this world. So 
Um, thank you so much for being my guest today. Thank you, Jay. Appreciate you. Great. And I hope we uh, get to see each other in person one day. Absolutely. Let's do it. All right. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. All Inclusive is a production of the Ruderman Family Foundation. Our key mission is the full inclusion of people with disabilities in all aspects of society. You can find All Inclusive on Apple Podcast, Google Play, Spotify, and Stitcher. To view the show notes, transcripts, or to learn more, go to rudermanfoundation.org slash all-inclusive. Have an idea for a podcast? Be sure to tweet at Jay Ruderman.